I just want a God-fearing woman. I, I love a woman that knows God. I, it sounds all very, like, cute, nah? Very unassuming. Uh, no. It's an actual fact a little bit more layered than that. Okay, they are banking on the fact that they're going to get away with murder because your Abrahamic faith teaches you that they can cheat on you, put you through the ringer. And not only will you forgive them, but you will be so excited to tell the world about how they put you through the ringer. But look at what God has done. I've said, and I will continue to say, there has to be another way for God to say, I love you, you're my child, you're doing great, outside of God giving you a man. Marriage cannot be the highest form of love that God can show to you when that marriage comes in this kind of form. It cannot be. You cannot hold on to a man because God sent him for you. It's not It's not a thing. Hello, 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 hi. And this is upsetting for me. It is me, as I. Small time to do your radio and these every internet. I'm back. Allow yala. A woman has gone viral on TikTok. And she's like, God saved her marriage. I'm going to um, stitch, if, if you would like, her TikToks. One is three minutes, one is four. And I'll play it on a higher speed. So maybe we get through it a, a little bit quicker. But I actually need you to watch the entire thing. So let's go. So 2018, when my husband and I first separated, once we got back together, I ended up getting pregnant. Honestly, it wasn't really the best time because we were trying to work on our marriage, we can do our intimacy, you know, and now we have to also worry about having another baby. So we tried to make it work and just focus on ourselves, but honestly, me being pregnant and my husband was trying to work through things and his own feelings, and he kind of got to a place where he was like, look, it's too little too late, and he let me know, like, look, I just can't do this anymore. First sonogram that I got, I sent it to my husband, and he didn't even respond. Like, that's how clocked out he was of our relationship, and it wasn't until, I want to say, like a month or two, maybe three months later that I found out that he was talking to someone at his job, and they were in a relationship. For the whole duration of my pregnancy, he is with that woman, and we have not communicated at all. No calls, no texts, he doesn't know anything about the baby, I don't know what's going on outside of, like, when I have conversations with his mom, and his mom is kind of telling me things, I'm believing that God is going to restore us, that he's going to change things around and it was hard because I'm pregnant I'm hormonal and I love his mom but there were even moments where talking to his mom was kind of detrimental for me because she would tell me things like oh you know they're having fun and they really like each other so in my mind I'm thinking he's in love with her and this is it like our marriage is over and I want to also say that throughout this time even though I wasn't talking to my husband the Holy Spirit would tell me a lot of things like sometimes I would have dreams about my husband and the Lord would just speak to me through scripture and there were times where God would give me dreams or give me scripture and then his mom would end up telling me something that confirmed exactly what God would tell me so even though one part of me thought okay our marriage is over and he wants this other woman I also knew that the truth of the matter was their relationship was very toxic so fast forward now I'm at the end of my pregnancy and one night I'm watching this prophetic video and at the time I didn't really like prophetic videos too much I was very like you know aware that some of these prophets are false so I didn't really take a lot of these videos too seriously but this night one of the videos they were talking about like God was going to do something in three days for some reason it stuck with me and I took mental note okay three days something is going to happen so the third day comes and I'm eating my bowl of cereal at night like I normally did it was like 11 o'clock and I'm getting ready to get in bed and I lift my leg up to get into the bed and I felt like this sharp pain like you know in my abdomen area I get up and I walk to the bathroom I go sit down and a gush of water comes out my water breaks so I'm sitting on the toilet I'm calling out to my mom she comes running out her first thing is well i'm gonna go tell donnie and in my mind i'm like do not call this man we have not talked in all the time that i've been pregnant he's probably not going to show up he wants nothing to do with us she decides to go ahead and call my husband anyway so now i'm on the toilet trying to figure out how i'm going to get up and you know get downstairs i'm leaking everywhere i'm worried about what is my husband going to think i don't want him to think that i'm pressuring him to be there and my mom is real adamant and i'm nervous because my first son was an emergency c-section so i've never had to push a baby out there was a lot going on in my mind my mom wakes my dad up to let him know that i'm in labor right now and she grabs my hospital bag up we walk outside to go put the stuff in the car and i look out into the street and i see my husband's car Part there. So I'll come back for part two so I can share what happens once I realize he's outside. So I see my husband standing out there. I get on my dad's van and we head to the hospital. Whole time we're on the way to the hospital, I keep looking back in the rearview mirror and seeing my husband like just keeping up with my dad. So I get to the emergency room, they put us in a wheelchair, and now we're just waiting for them to bring me into a room. So as I'm sitting there, my husband is there with us, but we're not saying a word to each other. So I change into like the gown and things like that. Once I change into the gown, they basically allowed me to like walk through the hallways to kind of make the labor progress. As I'm walking in the hallways, my mom is behind me and my husband is sitting on a chair. They had some chairs up against the wall and he's knocked out because he was working overnight job. Mind you, it is 11 o'clock, so he's literally snoring out loud. I'm walking, contractions are coming on strong. So we finally get back to the room. My husband is also sitting in the room and my mom is there with me and I'm still walking around because now I'm like, the contractions are hitting real bad. So I'm like, where's the epidural? Now I'm sitting on the hospital bed about to get the epidural and you know, they tell you like, don't move because it could hit a nerve or something like that. And the doctor, the doctor ends up telling my husband, oh, come and hold her. This doctor doesn't know how my husband and I are that we haven't talked. So my husband comes over and he just holds on to me. Y'all, I swear, when he put his hands on me, it like brought me so much peace. Like I felt so much more comfortable. It was like, once I get the epidural, I'm just laying there. My husband is still there. Like he's still sitting in that chair. We're not talking. My mom is not really talking to me and we're just waiting for my cervix to dilate. Even 
even more. After about an hour, my cervix is dilated completely and I end up starting to push. So I push, the baby comes out. Y'all, I have no idea what's going on with my husband or my mom or anybody. I'm just tired. Fast forward, now they move us to the room after you give birth. I forget what the room is called. And my mom ends up leaving, my husband ends up leaving. So I never get to tell him like, I want you to stay. We had zero conversation. My mom ends up FaceTiming me and basically just trying to say goodnight for the night because she knew like nobody was coming back and I wasn't expecting anybody to. So here I am preparing to be with my baby by myself for the first night and mentally I was ready. I was like, all right, this is just what it is. So I turn the TV on, I'm laying in the bed watching the TV and I hear a knock at the door. I'm thinking it's the nurse because y'all know when you have babies, the nurses are coming in and out constantly all day and there is a curtain right in front of the door. So the person opens the door and walks in. I still can't see them until they pull the curtain back. They pull the curtain back and it's my husband, y'all. And not only is it just him, he has a bouquet of flowers in his hand. So I am completely shocked. He walks in, he sits on the bed in front of me and for like 30 seconds, we're just looking at each other, just silent. He hands me the flowers, I take them, I put them on the table and we're back to silence again. So he starts to talk to me. I remember specifically what he said he was doing before he had got to the hospital. So he said he was in the shower and he was on his way to go be with the woman that he was with. And he said something in him was telling him, I don't wanna go be with her. I wanna go be with my wife. I wanna go be with Aisha. He said he called his mom and told his mom how he felt. And his mom said, well then go be with your wife. So he said he got out of the shower, went to go grab some flowers and came to me. And after that conversation, it was like nothing had ever happened. It was like we were not separated. It was like we hadn't stopped talking. He ended up picking up the baby and sitting next to me and he was trying to help me breastfeed y'all and all i could think about was the prophetic word that i saw that in three days something was going to happen and on the third day that is exactly what happened so the next day we get up and we're sitting in the hospital bed and it's like kind of early in the day and my husband is sitting next to me and he's on his phone and i notice that her name pops up on the screen and i don't tell him that i noticed this i just take note of it and i'm kind of discouraged but i'm like you know whatever i'm gonna let it go and the next day we spend the whole day at the hospital because our son had jaundice and then they finally let us go towards the end of the day so he drives us back to my mom's house and he ends up leaving I'm thinking that, okay, this is it. Like, everything's okay. He's going to stop talking to this woman. And no, that is not what happened. I want to say for the next couple of weeks, I honestly can't remember how long it was, but there were moments where he would show up to spend time with me and the baby and to see, you know, our oldest son. And then he would go and leave to go be with her. And I specifically remember one time we're all laying in the bed together and it just felt so comfortable. It felt so right. And he ends up getting a call. And I knew that it was her. And as soon as he got off the phone, he was like, I got to go. He was so discouraged that at one point I sent him a text and I basically was like, You win. Like, we can get a divorce. I'm not fighting for this anymore. I remember he texted me and was like, Okay, Zaysha. Just very upset. But God used my text message and he turned it all around for our good. So come back for part three so I can finish telling you how this story ends this woman is a coach she's out in the world somewhere and she's now a marriage coach that's what her bio says on her social media on her tiktok and i'm hoping it's something she's getting into and that she's not actually coaching somebody it's like you know the girls have ceo in the bio and stuff you know um so i'm hoping that's what's going on because the idea that this person is out there in the world coaching other women, possibly younger women who are we, 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 who are being brought up in a faith in um, a society at large that is constantly telling women that they need this institution. And this is the way to signal that you've made it, you're desirable, you are god's favorite you are you've made it essentially right a man said he wants you like that's so fucking hard to do uh it's it's ugh, come on now like be so for real um but she's sitting I'm, I'm hoping i'm hoping she's not out there coaching anybody i want to talk about <laughs> when you find yourself in a less than desirable situation and for the most part you can trace that a series of unfortunate events or decisions that you've made have brought you here that that misery loves company thing what about it makes it okay as women in particular why is it that when we're stuck in a situation that is not serving us we continue to preach it to younger women as it was done to us it's okay that you're in this situation, right? Because this is not just a her situation. I've seen um, women asking us all the time, Do you, don't you want to get married? She had a horrible marriage. Horrible. I don't know why. Why are you continuing to tout this thing as something aspirational to younger women when you did not have a good time in it? Your experience of it is not good. You were dehumanized essentially, but you're still recruiting for this thing. And it's, it's fine. You made your decisions. You're now there. Why can't you be honest with yourself and say, if I had the chance, I would do it differently. Why can't you be for younger women, what older, what the older women who came ahead of you weren't for you? Why can't you be that person that nobody was for you? I don't understand it.
I don't, I, I've, I've tried to explain to you guys how when I've journeyed into entrepreneurship, what I wish I'd done differently. And I'll continue to have those conversations with you guys, how I really feel about not having um, a safety net and all of that stuff. It's a very, very scary thing. And so I think that's why I'm confused when I see women who've endured so much in marriage continue to prop up this institution. And, and honestly, I hardly see with people who are in successful marriages. And when I say successful, I mean, there are challenges as there are challenges in relationships, like relating to anybody is like such a challenge in itself. Right. And maybe infidelity is not something that they've had to deal with, but life has thrown things at them and they, they, they had rough patches and whatever, but they come out happy. There's a respect. There's a healthy, um, manner of conflict resolution in their dynamic. You hardly see those women get on the internet and prop up this institution because most of them are very aware of the fact that they probably just like won the lottery. Most of them are so aware that most men aren't going to come like this. So what is the point of me getting on here and pushing women into this direction when I know that their counterparts or the people who should be their counterpart aren't being coached the same? So they won't be ready. When I say to the young girls, you know, um, behave this way and do this and do that, you know the young men aren't being told that. So you are preparing them to go partner with whom exactly? Do you understand? Those are the women, the women who are actually happy in their situations. If you ask them one-on-one, -on -one, they'll share with you what their journey is. That's been my experience. But they're hardly on a soapbox, just like yelling out, God did this for my man. It's always you miserable lot who look like you're a little bit malnourished because you're fucking stressed. It's always you guys trying to convince us that Oh, it's so great over here. Did you hear what this girl said? You went through pregnancy alone, ma'am. You went through a whole pregnancy alone and you are calling it God. And it's a bit layered there, right? Because you will find the scripture and use it to bulk your desires, right? Or to support or validate your desire to just be married. A lot of you just want to say, how many times does she say my husband? Like how many times does she say my husband? It's, you're telling on yourself. You stay in these institutions, in these situations because you think it's communicating something. You like the number as well, like the longevity. Or you think you, it's a sell to tell us that you've been with this person since you were 16. All I'm hearing is you've been like dribbled by the same dude from the time you're 16. That's all I hear. You guys know that's all I had hears when people say that because people change. Like people grow apart, people change, people learn different things. So whenever I hear that you've been stuck with somebody from the time you were a teenager, I don't hear what, like, whatever you pick, I, I'm not picking up. What you're putting down, I'm I'm like, oh, yeah. Look at that. Do you understand what I'm saying? Like, why are you doing that to the younger women? It's bothering me. It really, really bugs me. You can say, um, I, I won't leave. I won't leave, but I'm, I'm never going to encourage you to make these decisions. I'm here. I want to stay. I have my reasons. And no, they're not popular. No, I look like a ditzy bitch. And this is like some less than smart stuff, but I'm not going to leave. That said, you should not be like me. Th that's sisterhood. Y you are you staying in, like trying to bring other people and convince other people that you're staying here is of God, as diabolical. Like you are dangerous. You are truly dangerous because the guys, the the mind, hey, such a fragile thing. There are young women probably in her church, in her community, online, who look at her and she's beautiful and she's eloquent, and they're like, oh, she must have some wisdom to impart. And they're going to take this on. And as a result, and I'm not saying she's causing it, right? But as part of like a larger problem of especially church women convincing each other that it's okay for men to treat you any which way you just got to pray fire, fire, pray through it. And then when like the erectile dysfunction kicks in from him, like laying with this one and getting up and laying with that one, 
um, and finally like terrible things happening to him and he comes home now now you want to talk about how God restored sometimes I really think everybody is in heaven like looking around when you guys say stuff like Jesu is like how I get in this you know how Nini like honestly the angels are there by paired that they're trying to find the date of when they were involved in this commerce. They can't find it. They can't find it in the book of shenanigans because it's all you and that fucking man. It's all you. I just own it. Out of more respect for you, if you just said, Wow, kind of just love Donnie, man. Like he's got that thing and I I look stupid, but hey, a, a lot more people would actually let you be. A lot more people will let you be. You're right next to, I feel the same about the people who are having such a terrible time in parenthood, in motherhood, trying to tell the rest of us who have our, our, our angst and we're nervous and we're like, we don't know. And we're asking all the questions about, oh, do I really want to be a parent? Those people that are like, like, like don't, don't overthink it. Like you can never really be ready. Girl. You do, you are part, you're on the list of the things I look at when I'm like, but should I have a baby? Pros and cons. You you are there. You are in the co the column, yet cons. That's where you are. It says right there. Mamduba looks ashy since she had her third. Do I want to look like that hoe? Do you see? While you're sitting there saying things to me like and i'm like no but i can't afford it that's what they say here where i live baby like what the fuck i look like in like what what are you talking about what even when you find yourself in dire situation let allow yourself to be a cautionary tale allow yourself to be a deterrent for other women because other women were that for you and maybe not to the degree that they, but there's some decisions you backed away from making because somebody was brave enough to say, actually wrong turn. I made that turn and perhaps I haven't course corrected or I did. And at the time I thought I knew what I was doing, but actually sister, don't go down that path because this is how it ends. Be that person, be, be a real sister, not the stuff that you guys are doing. Oh my God. But that's all I wanted to say. That is, and I see it a lot, especially in the church. I see women do it to their own daughters. They own, you see the person that she's brought home and this person, and you can tell, mm -mm, this person is not it. This guy is not it. And then you go along, you go along so you can at least say she's married, especially when we get to a certain age. Yo, and I've been to those weddings where it's like, you guys, have you been to a wedding where the people know it's a mistake? Oh, oh, oh. Those who've been rocking with Rahari know I hate those like weddings where we can't like get high off of your love and make out with each other. Like, I don't like those weddings. Rahari does not want to be invited to those weddings where people are pregnant or you're getting married because you're 35 and you think it's time. Like it's another thing to check off your box and stuff. And then your mom goes along with it, but she can see that it's going exactly the same way that things went with you, with her and your father. You're making a mistake, but she just wants to be able to say, um, she wants to be able to say that because apparently it means something somewhere. Let's, let's do better. Let's be the people we... The, the person you wanted somebody to be for you, that real guardian, if you would like, be, be that person for the, like, and sometimes it's hard. It's hard. I'm not saying it's going to be fun. It's mostly going to be very unpopular and you're going to be like messing up the vibes, but be that person anyway. But anyway, that's all. I don't go bath. I got somewhere to go. Bye, Yala.